but it's not going to be self-entitled. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. O. It's a God pleasure to have you. you this morning. It's my honor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. My honor. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Jess. I want to close my laptop a little bit. Something wrong with the internet because I am in the other room. I will be in one minute. Okay, stay, stay. Bye. Okay, stay. no worries. Thank you, Liam. Okay, everyone, please go on mute. Um, as we, we just turned on the um, recording, so I wanted to you all to know that we are recording today uh, this session, and we're really excited to have you all with us. Uh, we are uh, this is the agenda. It's uh, We have a welcome, uh, two minutes. Uh, I will have a welcome note. And then we have the panel discussion moderated by Michelle Tajir, and then Q&A for 15 minutes. Just some housekeeping stuff. Please, if, everybody go on mute. And while the panel discussion is going on, please turn off your cameras. And then at the end, when the Q&A, uh, in the last 15 minutes during Q&A, you can turn your cameras back on. Uh, we'd love to see everybody. Uh, and uh, with no further ado, I'm going to start. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, good morning from San Diego, everyone. Uh, I know people are joining from everywhere. It's an honor to have you. I am Janine Aie, LabNet's Executive Director. LabNet is the premier network for tech entrepreneurs and professionals of Lebanese descent in North America. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the heartbreaking situation in Lebanon. Our country is facing incredible challenges once again, and my heart is with our families and friends. May God protect them and protect Lebanon. In these difficult times, I urge all of us to find ways to support however we can. As we Lebanese have learned, we must persevere and continue doing what we do best to survive and support our loved ones in our homeland. With that said, I am excited about today's event and our partnership with Alif Bey to bring you this deeper dive into AI and its impact on Arabic language and culture. My thanks to our moderator, Michelle Tajer, founder of Alif Bey Arabic Online, and our amazing panelists, Nisreen El Makouk, Vincent Khsou, Natasha Milik Freling, and Audrey Nakad, some of whom are joining from Lebanon. For all of you who are joining us from Lebanon today, thank you for holding the fort and keeping the light on for all of us expats. We will continue to stand by you. With no further ado, I will pass it to Michelle Tajir. Michelle, please kick us off. Thank you so much, Janine, and thank you to LabNet for hosting this event. It's an immense pleasure for me to moderate this panel on such a crucial and fascinating topic, which is navigating AI in EdTech for Arabic language and cultural learning. As Janine mentioned, I am the founder of Alif Bay Online, and I am joining from Lebanon. Uh, where I stand in solidarity with our teachers here, who I can report are in a safe place today. Uh, and I join Janine in uh, sharing a very heavy heart for all the displaced and the victims of this awful situation. Anyways, our mission needs to go on and our work and we continue our work. Uh, at Alif Bay, we have always strived to integrate technology into our classes uh, in a way that enriches learning and stimulates our students' growth. We're always seeking out tools that can develop 21st century skills to teach Arabic language and culture online. So you can imagine how excited I am to be here today. As we all know, technology is everywhere and education is no exception. However, education is a sensitive field. It shapes future generations. The challenge is how to best equip our children with the skills they need to succeed while fostering their personal development and preserving our cultural heritage. We don't want to produce a generation of identical robots. Our differences are our strengths. We'll dive into today's topic by making sense of some of the buzzwords we hear every day. Chatbots, virtual assistants, 
generative AI, large language models, LLMs, search engines, hallucinations, garbage in, garbage out for model training, gamification, NPCs, CPUs, GPUs, deep learning, and more. Beyond the opportunities AI offers, we will also address its challenges, such as privacy, authenticity, accuracy, regulations, and readiness in education. It's a lot, but we'll cover most of those. I'm very grateful to our panelists for accepting my invitation and collaborating on the key questions we'll explore. I will let each one of you introduce yourselves briefly, and then we'll dive into a 45-minute conversation followed by 15-minute Q&A session. Let's get started with introductions. Audrey? Hi, everyone. My name is Audrey Nakar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ostaz. Ostaz is the leading online tutoring platform in the MENA region. We offer a wide variety of courses, school subjects, university courses, languages. And I'm thrilled today and excited to be talking in this panel about you know, AI and how it, it has transformed our business. Um, I believe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super excited and definitely we're all here today just a small thought about Lebanon and everyone that's in Lebanon uh, you know we have to pray for the situation to get better thank you Vincent hello I'm Vincent I'm the founder of uh, Nisky Craft and founder of Falafel Games uh, previously so we uh, develop and publish games on PC on mobile um, for a long time I published games targeting Arabic speakers and now we have a game tech solution that we use to publish our own games and to lend to other studios to do to do global markets. Um, so specifically with regards to you know our use of AI, obviously you know it's uh, it's very evident that like the gaming industry is at the forefront of adopting AI. There's a lot of like things that are already very uh, common, such as generative AI, especially for using uh, for creating art from concept and more and more towards production, uh, full pipeline, <clears throat> we use that. But that's that's become like using email by these days. Yeah. Um, I think we already well. dove into the first question with Vincent. <laughs> we were just introducing each one. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you want to <laughs> keep going? No, tell us. Tell us more about... Uh, no, let's finish the round of intros you. and then we take yeah. into these things. Yeah. Yeah. Natasha? My, hello, my pleasure to be here today. My name is Natasha Milic Freiling, and I'm research director at the Arabic Language Technologies uh, team here in uh, QCRI, Qatar Computing Research Institute in Doha. Uh, Qatar Computing Research Institute is sort of a catalyst for innovation, and uh, my team, ALT team, has been working on Arabic language technologies, and I'm happy to tell you more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this Good evening, everyone. My name is Nasreen Makouk. I'm the co-founder of Kam Kalima, uh, which is a technology solution that supports schools in the teaching and learning of Arabic. We currently serve approximately 100 schools in the MENA region um, and um, help uh, um, children develop the language uh, competencies that they need to be uh, um, thinkers, speakers, and writers in Arabic, and really looking forward uh, to uh, the very interesting discussion that we have in store. Amazing. Thank you so much. So our first question is... Um, has been, uh, Vincent started uh, answering it, and it's about uh, how the emergence of Gen AI impacted your work. Um, do you wanna continue on what you started, Vince? How did Gen mm -hmm. AI impact your work in the field of gamification? So I mentioned the Gen AI earlier. We are users yeah. of Gen AI, and that's obviously, okay. you know, uh, accelerates, uh, pipelines, uh, lead times, and reduces costs. But it's still a race. I mean, it doesn't change much in the overall uh, situation of uh, uh, the competition between studios. 
because it's available for everybody and it's an arms race towards you know it's an arms towards arms race towards zero essentially uh but you know some use cases can be used uh, in a more specific way for for specific target audiences and in a creative manner for example uh ai allowed us to do some creative steps such steps such as for example creating trivia games whereby the content is um, automatically uh, generated based on responses based on interest and also based on trends um so that's like a very specific use case which worked pretty well with us so essentially i mean we joke about it with my team because on that specific use case because um Initially, we had people create the content. Now they're replaced by machines. And it's a machine that does the advertising to bring in the traffic. And maybe soon the player would be a machine. God knows. Um, uh, and, you know, like, uh, for example, fixing in terms of uh, things where some education is involved, can could be involved and that come from gaming is the fact of adaptive difficulty. So in the past uh, difficulty, we used to adapt it by using some logic, some parameters, uh, measurement and then uh, tweaking uh, of, you know, in our case, in the gaming case, difficulty levels. But now we just gave this to the machine adaptively. So based on the retention of the player. So like, okay, the player enters a level. Do we want them to win or lose? What's the win rate here? Um, let's say we want to, you know, what do we want to the win rate to achieve? We want the win rate to achieve retention. And so you tell the model, my output is retention optimized for that and the input is a win rate tweak that coefficient things like that you know this comes from gaming and i'm thinking just out loud what we've been using in terms of ai that maybe could be used in education you maybe graphics as well right i mean creation of graphics as well yeah yeah definitely even creation mm -hmm. of levels so playable yes. levels for example for like simple uh still simple levels for kids uh, like things like matching, uh, memory, uh, connecting dots, uh, mm -hmm. colors. More and more you can uh, delegate it to a large degree, already dedicate like, a large part of the pipeline to the machine. So thank you so much. This is uh, Gen AI in content creation, really, and in adaptability to the level of, of the learners. Uh, what about in uh, Kem Kalima, for instance, how uh, Gen AI was um, used? And Absolutely, they... thanks, Michelle. Um, so I, I may take a few steps back and start even before uh, uh, Gen AI. We're very proud uh, that uh, as a team, Kem Kalima, we um, uh, started um, uh, integrating AI into our uh, service offering early on. So um, one of the first ways we used that was to support students directly in writing. And writing in Arabic was one of the <clears throat> most difficult tasks for students and something they really struggled with. Um, and that's when uh, we um, uh, uh, created Fahim, the intelligent assistant who helps students but does not do their work for them. So how did we use uh, AI for that purpose? One of the struggles uh, that we see very often with students is um, um, the confusion between the spoken or the colloquial Arabic and the classical uh, or standard Arabic, which is the language that is taught in schools. And this was one way where um, we could uh, train Fahim to pick up on uh, vocabulary from different dialects that students often use in their writing and suggest to them the standard uh, alternatives for this, allowing them to uh, uh, improve uh, their writing, their syntax, their vocabulary acquisition, etc. With Gen AI, um, we're uh, very excited to be uh, training some models that will now be able to support teachers um, in curating and uh, uh, creating content that helps them target specific needs of specific um, uh, students, making their work a lot faster and a lot more effective. 
Thank you so much. So you've answered the obstacles also transitioning from scripted AI to Gen AI, and you've also tackled uh, the um, the obstacles. Uh, well, not all. We're going to come back to that. You talked about diglossia, diglossia, and uh, and all the other obstacles that are due that are specific to the Arabic language. What about you, uh, Audrey? Uh, how did Jen? Yes, I know, Natasha, we're coming. <laughs> uh, um, Audrey, how did the Gen AI impact your work? I know you have a platform uh, that matches tutors with uh, students. So in that, from that aspect, how did Gen AI impact your work? So it's important to take a step back a bit and to understand what we're trying to do here. We are building a marketplace. And let me tell you how Gen AI has impacted Ostaz in two ways, from a processes standpoint and from an educational standpoint. I would like to start with the first point, which is more the processes. So as a marketplace, you have the supply and demand. And the key to succeed in a marketplace is scale. So thanks to the advancement of AI, we streamlined all our processes on the supply side and on the demand side. Let me give you some concrete examples. We have a very thorough recruitment process to make sure that every single feature on our platform is vetted. Before using AI, our HR used to read every single CV, cover letter, test them manually, interview them, and onboard them. Now, uh, so what does this mean? It means that we need an army of recruiters to be able to, re to onboard thousands of teachers. With AI, it does the job of selecting the good CVs based on the criteria we're looking for. It created automated testing so we can test their expertise and get um, to only the inter you know, get to interview only the best one. We are exploring now using an AI recruiter. This is to tell you that thanks to AI, we onboard 300 teachers in only one week with only one resource. So that tells you more about scalability. On the demand side, we receive so many leads from potential clients, students, parents. So instead of reaching out to every single lead, we have an AI bot that would determine the seriousness of each client. So it, imagine how much time it saves us and it helps us prior, prioritize the good leads. Lastly, on the content part, if we'd like to talk about it, we're able to develop content in no time for free, and that before was a hassle. So, for instance, if we'd like to help because we're a tutoring platform and most teachers and students need content, before to develop one content, we used to pay teachers, they used to cost us, you know, a lot of money, it takes 12 hours of prep work. Now it takes in a matter of minutes, we have content, but definitely this content is then reviewed viewed by our experts. I, I love what you're saying, Audrey, because this brings me to the next question that Natasha is very eager to answer. What are the downsides of all that AI that is helping scalability and content creation? Natasha, please tell us from your point of view, how, uh, what are the risks and how are we able to mitigate them? And what are the stakeholders that need to be taken into account in that process? Thank you, Michelle. So I would just like to say the AI use um, and the benefits and the pitfalls depend on the use scenario. What was just described oh, is a fantastic yeah. scenario. It is the scenario that fits perfectly what AI can do well. I mean, the productivity in reviewing the masses of documents that you humans we cannot really do in a decent time. And uh, um, because these are experts anyway, uh, who can judge at the end the results, that, that risk is very much diminished. And what I want to only say, what, what was mentioned before, AI, that we have generative AI right now, and Nizreen already said that we had techniques before AI. There were machine learning techniques, there were deep learning things, and so generative AI is just the latest thing that we are calling AI. However, so there are many, many benefits from the um, techniques if they find the right scenario for the right purpose. With the generative AI, general risk is that if the expert doesn't review it, then the non-expert will not know whether something is true or not. So basically the user generative AI only as good as the expert using it. Because I can recognize if something is correct because I know it's something correct. If I don't know, 
Unfortunately, generative AI doesn't have a self-validation. It often has to have a cross-validation with some other system. And most recently in the QCRI, we have merged uh, large language models with additional models, like a, a solver, a logical engine that can at least check the answer that is logically correct. So, so in the future, I believe this is exactly what LL, uh, large language models and generative AI can come in. If there are other systems or the processes that can tame it, meaning scope it, so that uh, does well what it does well, and whatever doesn't is recognized as a limit and addressed. You on mute, Michelle. Sorry. Yes, yes. This is uh, very, very eye-opening and interesting. I just would like for uh, uh, just to 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 clarify that the real difference between AI and Gen AI. Why don't you give us this little uh, for 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 people who really are are interested and and didn't dig deeper into the subject? Um, yeah, go ahead. Now you're mute. Now you're mute. You're mute, Natasha. <laughs> okay. I'm very happy to talk about this because uh, because of what was mentioned so far. We had AI for ages. Uh, uh, QCRI, Qatar Computing Research Institute, when I joined, I joined two years ago, already 11 years of tradition in creating Arabic language technologies based on different methods, machine learning methods, deep learning methods. We had what we call small models which would uh, do spell checking for me, translation from Arabic to English, summarization, diacritization. Those were all what you call mini models. But then what happened with generative AI, now there's a big model that, that, can ask, that can enable me to do any task. So instead of asking to check my spell checking or grammar checking, I can say, well, write me an essay. So, so mm -hmm. what has happened now, computing can address tasks that are much, much uh, more complex. And uh, the method that generative AI uses is really predicting the next word. So it doesn't have in itself any mechanism to, uh, correct, uh, to check the logic or even verify the facts. So we are working very, very hard to create a model that can or complement it with other things to make sure that the correctness is there. But other AI elements are still there. You should not forget them. Uh, large language models are very expensive. Uh, you know, they're run in the United States, you know, big, that we are using them just like we use Google, right? Like Google search and things like that. But if you need to have something on your mobile phone or somewhere else, small spell checker can still work for you very well. And that's also AI. Just want to say, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, so uh, Gen AI is mostly developed in in the U.S. and uh, and when we do our when we use it, uh, we run into uh, some risks of uh, for the Arabic language or Arabic learners. We can run in a risk of not having the responses we need uh, in a contextualized cultural context. So uh, maybe Nisreen can talk to us about this and how you mitigate that. And also, um, are, your, are your stakeholders ready to use Gen AI? All your stakeholders, the students, the teachers, the parents, and maybe Natasha can add uh, something about the governments and the institutions who are regulating that, uh, that offer. Thank you, Michelle. So if I may add uh, to the uh, very important points uh, mentioned by Natasha earlier, uh, absolutely, as, um, as we work on uh, training specific Gen AI models to support education, we have struggled uh, with the limited data sets available in Arabic uh, uh, and the availability of open source Arabic models in general, which tend to be uh, far more available uh, in English. And this poses a challenge, particularly because Arabic is a very rich uh, and nuanced language. So you need a lot of uh, data to be able to train an effective uh, model. Um, um, 
Well, uh, to, to mitigate that, um, we're lucky that our own data as Kamkalima that uh, over the past uh, uh, few years um, is uh, very suitable to train uh, the model because it is uh, it is um, uh, accurate data that we know is correct. It is developed by uh, experts, it is linked to specific learning outcomes. So we know that using this existing uh, data to train will help us uh, getting the results that uh, we need. Now, the question you ask about readiness is also um, very important because if we have the best tools, but we don't have the adoption to make use of them, then um, th that's not really uh, a value. So here we have to look at, um, you know, we have to ask multiple questions. Are the students ready? Are the teachers ready? Are the schools ready? And what is needed? Um, of course, uh, um, in terms of digital skills, um, students are digital natives uh, or much more at ease and comfortable with, with technology. I think the risk um, for students is over-reliance uh, on, um, um, you know, things like uh, um, uh, Gen AI. So here it's very important to make sure that the skills students need to use AI effectively and to override this is, uh, it continues to be uh, robustly in the curriculum, how to think critically, how to analyze, these higher order skills that allow us to engage with, um, you know, what we see, determine how valid or reliable uh, it is. Now, teachers, there's uh, definitely a level of intimidation uh, uh, with technology in general, and as it moves quickly, of course, this uh, this uh, uh, intimidation can increase. So for us, it's very important, um, uh, the component of educating uh, the user or training the teachers, pro offering professional development that uh, allows them to understand this technology and understand how to use it effectively. So like very recently, we've done a lot of work helping teachers um, with prompt engineering. How can we get Gen AI to support us? These are additional skills that uh, maybe were not um, um, on the table earlier. And finally, when it comes to schools, um, I think there's a policy level that is still um, that is still needed uh, in terms of where does this fit? How is it used and for whom? Um, and of course, there's, you know, there's also uh, a budget component of uh, what can we spend on and what is, you know, uh, what value does that bring? So it's very important to be able to create solutions that are within, uh, 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 that are accessible, uh, but also effective and reliable. Thank you so much. I want to uh, build on what you were saying about the teachers and the up upskilling rather than uh, downskilling the teachers by letting them, you know, develop content and uh, and and just rely on that on on the on Gen AI without upskilling them. So I want to hear from Audrey maybe about the content development uh, from your teachers. How are you dealing with that, if you would like, yeah? Yes, definitely. And, and you know, I'm going to discuss this and also add to what Nisreen said. And just to explain to the audience here, it's very important for you to know what's tricky and the challenge that we're facing when it comes to content. It's about how to prompt Gen AI. And prompting, as she mentioned, it's a new domain and it's a skill that we need to learn. If today we all go on ChatGPT and prompt something different, the result would be different. And you have to know that your output of the model that you're using is as good as your prompt, as good as your input. And so uh, also this answers one of the questions in the audience, can you claim it to be your own content? 
what we do, we never take it. We never take the content as is because, as she mentioned, Natasha, you have to be very careful. I had a mo I had actually a workshop on ChatGPT. It's as good as Bing, so they're getting the results from Bing. The model is very powerful, but if you you have to feed it with your own information. So for example, talking about content creation at Ostas, not only we have subject matter experts, but also we have eight years of data. So whatever data that we have, we put it into that model. The output will be 10 times better than just you know prompting open AI. And whatever we get as an output, we always double check, tweak it, adapt it and run it by uh, our subject matter experts. We don't take the content as is and say it's correct. As Natasha said, uh, you know, uh, we have the impression that it's so well done. If you're not an expert, you're gonna think it's correct. But as soon as an expert take a deeper dive into it, they notice that there are, there are lots of nuances. So talking about Arabic, I would like to add something that definitely we struggled with especially that we're present in the MENA region and in the UAE, we have so many dialects, is the fact that it requires a system to understand and respond accurately across the different variations and the different dialects, so which is very tough. And as, she mentioned, as we mentioned previously, it's not only data scarcity when it comes to Arabic language, but it's also a shortage of high quality content and data in Arabic that's available. I hope I answered your question. Michelle, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. You, uh, thank you so much, Audrey. Of course, it builds on, on what uh, Nisleen said before and Natasha. Uh, you're talking about scarcity of data and quality of content. Uh, Natasha, and also uh, Nisreen mentioned um, the um, the issue with the policy makers and how uh, the regulations are framed and if there are any and uh, what is the status of the regulation around uh, Gen AI in the Arab world. Natasha, can you um, tackle these two questions? Again, I, I know you talked about scarcity of data, and uh, and of high uh, high quality content. Please, I mean, uh, just in two words, tell us what are the remedies, if any, that you have been researching. And second, uh, what are the policies that are on the table right now in the Arab world? So indeed, for Arabic language, and Arabic language uh, is in a similar situation in almost all other languages, believe it or not, because. English is the predominant one. So, so, so the, most of the models are trained on English because it has been, you know, thanks to the, thanks to the British who spread around the world and spread the language around the world, most of the people are using it as a common language. So all other languages uh, are sort of suffering in the disproportion of the uh, material that goes into these language models. So there are many, many techniques. People are trying to do translation so they would try to translate from English to Arabic to make more. But that means you have to have a really, really good translation. And talk about dialects, can you translate also into dialects? Believe it or not, but at QCRI, we worked before on small models that did uh, translation. At, at one point, we were much better than even commonly used ones, like the Google ones, for example. We have recently complemented the small language translation with the large language models, and we are now again excelling. So it is possible to create some of these technique uh, uh, enablers to beef up or create more data through either a translation or there's another technique which is synthesis. So you give some examples and then you guess what? You use large language model to help you create more and then you have an experts check it and then you put it back into the system. So there are a number of techniques. Now, going back a little bit to the prompting and the policies and the use of large language models, we have to be a bit careful because just like when you go to online um, search engine, Bing or um, um, Yahoo or uh, Google, we put our queries. The queries go to the services that they have, and then they can, based on queries, improve their system. Similarly, any content that's given and any prompt that's given to systems are taken by these systems to improve them. Now, you'll be very careful if you want to put students' grades there with the names and grades. 
you don't want that because this is private information, right? So there are certain limitations you can't put in your prompt. If you want such a such student with these grades to be, um, give you an idea of what the progress is going to be. You but better don't put it in the prompt because that will be sitting on some server in the United States, open AI, which over whatever system you're using. So what we are now looking also is what are the possibilities of creating medium-sized language models that are still performant, but they can be bring in the country. So uh, at QCRI, we are working on a system which is going to be Qatar uh, language model. And that one can be put uh, with the Ministry of Education and Higher Education or Ministry of Interior or Ministry of Culture. In, and it can be used in a, in a private way, um, protecting the sovereignty and also protecting the privacy of the citizens. Thank you. So this, uh, you think this model would is is replicable in other countries as well, uh, or in fact, there are already. So UAE has uh, has already three: Noor, Jais, uh, Falcon. Then Alama is in Saudi. So Qatar is going to have some, and others are going to come up with more. So these are uh, language models that uh, are often um, treated much more carefully with the proportion of uh, Arabic language uh, uh, content and uh, others, uh, let's say English, for example, or German or French, in kind of different proportion that you would just have by crawling the web. Yeah, And if you can come with clean data. So instead of going brute force and pushing everything in, you can try to make it cleaner and see how far you can go with that sort of quality assurance. And this way, we can make sure that privacy and authenticity are uh, are is protected, right? Uh, Vincent, yes. uh, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, Vincent, uh, yeah, what's your take on that? And uh, how do you feel your target audience is, uh, is ready for the challenges uh, of this new technology? And also uh, in... Uh, you can tell us about what you're working on uh, lately. Please. Yeah, sure. So we're building a bunch of games, uh, MMO, RPGs, uh, word games, um, store simulator games, uh, a platform actually for toddlers to learn Arabic uh, by playing. Uh, and we use a bit of AI in that. Um, the, I mean, it, I think, I don't know if it's the correct way or not, but for us, it should just be like uh, abstract to the user. Uh, the user should not uh, really care, or you know, or think, you know, if we're using any AI or not. And sometimes the use of AI, like for example, when we use AI for adaptive difficulty, or when we use AI to mine the data uh, in a way that we target our users better it's actually impacting the life of the user because we use AI, but not directly. <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't even need to know. It's just like they don't need to know whether you're using a, uh, I don't know, an SQL database or a NoSQL database. So they, I think it's just, at least in most of the use cases we have, so adaptive difficulty, content creation, level creation, our own, our own like art pipeline, whether we used the, uh, AI or not is not really important to our end users. Now, um, privacy, I mean, th there is a bit of uh, intersection with privacy and privacy is generally taken care of by you know, regulation and uh, platforms, like Apple and Google and uh, what, you know, you always have to touch a platform at some point, Microsoft. Uh, uh, so, like, but specifically, you know, for example, using information related to a user in a non-anonymized way and mixing it in our models, we wouldn't do that. We don't do that. We're not allowed. I don't think we're allowed. <laughs> uh, but we just anonymize all the tokens. We have to anonymize all the uh, users. Anyway, so what I mean here is, by way of example, so let's say uh, you're a student in school, uh, in school X. Uh, Michelle is a student in school X and Nisreen is a student in school X. I'm not, I, you know, I don't feed the information that Michelle is a student in school X. I only feed the information to the model that I have two users who are in school X or I have a user who's currently in Lebanon and who's in school X and another user who's maybe also in Lebanon. And 
uh, in school X to fit the model. Uh, users also don't like generally speaking, except um, like very committed uh, users, nobody cares. And I noticed that in the West, specifically in the United States, they actually care much more than, for example, in Asia. If you look, if you like, you know, it's the same thing with the adoption of crypto. Uh, that's another topic, but it, you see similar behavior. Like, for example, you know, users in Korea, in Japan, in China, they actually like it more. Like, if probably it's good if you tell them that you have AI, that you're yeah. infringing on their privacy, and that you're have. I mean, infringing. You don't have to say it in such a negative connotation. But what you say, you could say. I mean, what actually happened, they say, is that, oh, we're learning about you so that we service you better. People in China love that, like it. Uh, right. So I think, uh, sorry, I think that, yes, in Asia and all these countries, they are benefiting from the progress made in the West and they go much faster and uh, they're interested in advancing and progressing much faster. But still, I mean, I think that uh, we do have in the Arab world also some uh, governments and institutions that are um, putting regulations for uh, to protect the users and uh, and the other stakeholders in in this field. Uh, now, just a round of table uh, to tell us uh, what are you working on lately? What are the last uh, gen? AI tools that you are working on, each one, and then we'll go to uh, the questions and answers. Okay, uh, is it okay, uh, Janine? Can we do that? Okay. Uh, uh, Audrey, you wanna tell us about sure. your latest uh, innovation? Definitely. If you go now to www.ostaz.com, you can already have access to our AI labs. It's free of charge. So we created it because we noticed that First of all, since we can innovate a lot and it doesn't cost us much, we will help learners, first of all, craft better their cover letter. So we have a free workshops, a workshop on it. Second thing, we noticed that most of the high school students, they struggle to find the right university and right major. So if you go to our lab, it would ask you the right personalized question based on you know your personality, what you're looking for, your major. It would tell you which university you should go to and uh, where to apply. So that's an interesting, mod, you know, an interesting kind of, AI lab that we're kind of uh, testing right now. Now, where we're going and what we're passionate about, I think, and this is what's amazing about AI, the AI will lower the cost of teaching, the lower the cost of education and make it more accessible. Let me tell you what we're doing in tutoring per se. So the first, as you know, the first tutoring lesson, you pay it, right? Whether you're just introducing yourself or, you know, the, the teacher is, spending half an hour to know what level of Arabic you're in. Instead, uh, we do a first assessment, right, run, done by AI. It's an AI test that will give the private tutor all the information about the level of the student and create a personalized lesson plan. So here, I feel that instead of paying 20 bucks, for example, an hour, I'm paying a dollar for this test, and all of my results would go to the uh, private teacher. So that's the first thing that we're doing. Second thing, it's the homework and assignment and the whole learning journey. Because at the end of the day, when you do private tutoring, let's talk about language, right? You learn a language Arabic. It's great. You have your session. You're done with your session. But if you don't practice, we have an issue here. I mean, you won't improve as much. So instead of, you know, as, as we spoke about the teacher, the teacher... And this is what, how we saw the adoption. They're much more excited to know that we're upskilling them and for them not wasting time preparing for homework and, you know, uh, correcting homework and assignments. So this is where our AI tool would come in to create homework and assignments based on the data and content created by our teacher and also correct it. And it's 24-7. So it would uh, actually push notifications to our learners at the right time and immediately they would get our students instant gratification by the correction and the AI would say wh which mistake they did and refer back to our recording uh, because we record all our tutoring sessions and our students have access to it. 
talking about recordings and our online recordings, they would be analyzed like today, how you have with your Google Meet and it analyzes your meeting and create kind of meeting notes. We're doing, we're gonna do the same for tutoring. How amazing would it be if it creates kind of a summary, some slides, important points for me. Uh, and definitely it goes without saying the 24 seven assistance. It's like right now you can go on chat GPT and prompt it and it would answer any question. Now, definitely where we're, where we're going into is math and all these modeling, it's, it's definitely another level that we'd like to explore. Um, this is it uh, for me. This is amazing. I think at Alif Bay, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna approach you and, and, uh, and see what we can uh, collaborate on. Uh, we use human intelligence for now, but maybe we're going to go through, uh, <laughs> through what you're going through AI, <laughs> artificial intelligence. Uh, Nisreen, um, what are your plans and uh, your uh, innovation? Sure, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what we're doing and also address some of the uh, some of the questions that came up in the chat uh, together. Oh, so, okay, that's great. Uh, yeah. Okay, so is it um, okay, uh, Janine? We're going to answer the questions while we continue. Okay, great. Thank you, Nisri. All right. So uh, as we said, um, uh, helping teachers build their skills in terms of working with AI is a priority. Uh, and for that, and, and this is responding to Abid, who asked a very good question in the chat, we actually uh, produce knowledge in Arabic uh, that is uh, um, it catered to, uh, to teachers because it's very important to have uh, resources that they can learn from and, and refer to. I'm very grateful for my colleague Sirun who put the uh, link uh, for Hiyam who asked uh, uh, for some support in prompt engineering. Um, so please feel free to download this uh, booklet, uh, uh, small booklet in Arabic that will guide you to understand better uh, um, how you can navigate uh, Gen AI. What we're super excited about is the capacity for this uh, uh, Gen AI model that we're training to, to pave the way for adaptive and personalized learning. Because as we know, uh, no single classroom uh, is is um, is consistent in terms of every learner having the same needs and being at exactly the same level. So for education to be effective, you need to be able to cater to each learner where they are. And this is where Gen AI allows teachers to do that far more efficiently and effectively, um, and as such, improve the quality uh, of the teaching and learning uh, that that uh, we take part in. Thank you. Michelle, you're Absol on mute. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, Nisreen. I totally agree with you. Natasha, the final word is for you before we go to more questions. Yes, so first to clarify, Qatar Computer Research Institute is a research institution. We have lots of technologies that we have built over the past years. So we always look for opportunities to kind of um, pay the way, show people what's possible with the state of the art technologies. So even before the market asks us. But in this context, I want to describe two applications. One is called Numui, which is Arabic AI Writing Assistant. And then we have another one called QVoice, which is for pronunciation learning. So the children can see immediately if they pronounce a word wrongly. Um, in the, the main principle has been, even though we have all of these capabilities, to put it in the, in the context that uh, um, abides by the pedagogical principles, yet uh, can extend uh, engagement that the teacher does in the classroom during the practice say, at home. So we are working uh, on, on a particular problem, and that's the problem of Arabic language, where there is a um, influ influence of English, and children are more likely to speak English than speak Arabic. So we have a competition among languages. In the classroom, the teacher may be Syrian, speaking their dialect. The child is from Qatar, speaking Qatari dialect, mostly English, and they have to learn MSA, Modern Standard Arabic. So we have at least four languages that to deal with. So the, the whole application and the interface interaction 
has to enable the child to understand the task. If they don't understand it in MSA, in modern Southern Arabic, they may understand in their dialect. If they don't understand the dialect, they may understand it in English. So, uh, so the principle by which we create this environment is to lead the child in the most comfortable first, so they can address the problem and then get, uh, kind of wean them off so that they can understand MSA. Thank you. Amazing. This is what we use also, and we call it translanguaging in our classes. But yeah, you're doing it in a more automated <laughs> way, which is amazing. Yes. So uh, thank you all for all these amazing um, information and input. Uh, do we have any more questions that we did not answer? What are some resources that you lean on? Yeah. Uh, I think Nisreen answered this one. Michelle, we can also ask people if they feel comfortable to turn their cameras on and uh, raise their hand if they have a question and participate in the last few minutes of this discussion. Okay. <laughs> Uh, بال, بالتست اللي هو الادمشن تيست او الليفل تيست يا ريت لو في لينك مثلا اذا احنا محتاجين ندخل له او نتعلم او نشارك فيه uh, بعرفش غير هذا ولا this is the one that they send me I think this question is for Ustaz right do you want to put your just the link to Ustaz yes I think I think Sirun shared a link uh, mm -hmm. me what I can do uh, yam, we can sit together and I can help you because it's not a one size fits all. And Hasab, what are your objective? Uh, oh. You know, uh, I have to sit with you, understand what you're looking to get from this AI model, from this testing. What's your, you know, objective? Because our objective is a bit different than a school. So, so we have to sit together. I can uh, tell you more how to prompt it. Okay, uh, so great. if you want, I can send you my contact information, uh, you know, via the chat and we can yes, definitely please. sit together. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Any other questions? Okay. 9.55. I just want to say, I just want to say. There is a uh, question, Michelle, from, for Vincent. Oh, okay. What are I the have a question that for can help the kids learn Arabic? That's a great resource, actually, Vincent, for everyone uh, also here in the diaspora. We'd love to know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Ah, nice. So, uh, actually, we're working on a game with uh, the founders of uh, Lila TV, which is the largest, one of the largest, like, school uh, ch uh, kids' channels with Arabic, uh, with the Lebanese dialect. Uh, so, that we're, we're creating it uh, for them. We're helping them with the... Uh, the production and the distribution, but it's really their brainchild. And for example, adapt adaptive uh, adaptive difficulty and stuff like that, or deciding which content to offer to who at what point in time are things that we use from our expertise. It's called Abjad, A-B-J-A-D. It's very cliche, uh, but it was the name that picked up the most. Uh, I think this is the first time I divulged that uh, this is uh, the brainchild of uh, Lila TV. Um, we're, you know, working with some other uh, like institutions to unveil the fact that I just uh, leaked. This is amazing. We have a scoop, uh, <laughs> Janine. Yes, uh, so nice. we have Abjad. I know that uh, Nisreen and Natasha also met through this uh, webinar, through this panel, and they are going to be working together. So I want to say that... Uh, it's all about collaborating, honestly, to advance in technology and innovation. It's also about a, a huge balancing act uh, between upskilling of all the stakeholders and acting responsibly. I don't know if we stressed enough about acting responsibly because technology can get out of hands. And, uh, and we educators really don't want to do that. So we're happy to have research centers that are uh, protecting and working hard. 
and also innovators like Ustas and uh, Kam Kalima and uh, and uh, Falafel Games. I know I know you from Falafel Games, Vincent. I didn't know you you pivoted to something else. So any thank you again to all. Any last questions? We have time for one last question. That's my last question. Yalla. Yalla. Uh, I am in California high school credits. Uh, I created this class about the, about the MENA culture. So there is no any content online. It's uh, everything related to the religious, politics, and we are very far from this um, direction. So uh, if you can help me, I need all the um, information about... Uh, the those companies because i will take i want to create something related to our culture with the um, arabic language i think you can check your qfi qatar founder uh, qatar foundation international they have a lot of resources on their website and mm -hmm. uh, then using gen ai is a matter of knowing how to use it so to create content i am I, yeah, I, I am like you, Nabila, <laughs> and uh, maybe I would rely on, um, I don't know, anyone can, uh, oh, yeah, Vincent is creating content, also cultural content, no, uh, through your games, you're infusing them with culture? I mean, games are cultural products of their own, but uh, I mean, the furthest we go is the one I just mentioned to you, Abjad. Uh, in the past, we did create games that uh, were very imbibed with uh, uh, think, with Arabic culture. Yeah, I think for, like for yeah. I think for uh, the teacher in California, she just talked about it. I think Iman Hashim, she's you know uh, a member of Qatar Foundation, and uh, she has a book. She published a book about the units and there is no religion, no politics in it at all. If you contact with her, she's really good and she will help. Awesome. She all right. We, thank you, everybody. I think we, uh, Michelle, you ready to wrap up? Yes, yes. I'm, uh, I, 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 I concluded by saying it's a collaboration uh, uh, act and I'm happy that we were all here talking about this uh, technology that is going to be the future and all um, working together to uh, keep it safe and as, as innovative as possible. Thank you all. Thank you, Janine, for Thank you, uh, hosting Michelle. us. Thank you for our panelists as well. Thank Amazing you. information. I just wanted to close by saying that although uh, the U.S. is leading the charge on ChatGPT and Gen AI, we're all sharing the same issues with quality of data processes, uh, education, upskilling, nervousness, uh, non-ethical behavior. So we are united as humanity with all of this stuff. And um, I'm very impressed with uh, what us in the MENA in Lebanon are doing with, uh, with this and the tools we're using to advance education and aid it. So thank you all. This has been amazing for me and I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you very much. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.